Early voting also begins today in Texas. But for the first time in a federal general election in that state, voters will have to comply with what critics say is one of the toughest voter ID laws in the country. A months-long attempt to temporarily block the law ended in the early morning hours Saturday when the Supreme Court agreed with an appeals court that overturned an injunction against the law, even as the question of its constitutionality continues to wind through the courts. Joining together to oppose the ruling were the court's three women justices, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, whose scathing dissent was joined by Justices Elena Kagan and Sonia Sotomayor. Ginsburg appeared to agree with the decision of the trial court judge, who had called the law a poll tax, writing that the greatest threat to public confidence in elections in this case is the prospect of enforcing a purposefully discriminatory law, one that likely imposes an unconstitutional poll tax and risks denying the right to vote to hundreds of thousands of eligible voters. Sherilyn Eiffel is with the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, and Texas State Representative Trey Martinez Fisher is the chairman of the Mexican. American Legislative Caucus. Thank you both for being here. Thank you, Joy. And, and I want to start with you, um, uh, Mr. Fisher, because you, you are your group was one of those that actually um, brought this case because of the prospect of hundreds of thousands of Texans, mainly black and Latino, who will or possibly will be denied the right to vote in Texas. Do you still worry that the number of potential people who won't be able to vote is as high as 600,000? Absolutely. We know that voter ID is really a solution looking for a problem. And when you study the data, after 2008 and 2010, 13 million people voted in the state of Texas, and only two people accepted responsibility for in-person voter impersonation. But we know that over 600,000 people today are registered to vote in the state of Texas, but do not have the forms of ID that they need to vote in this election. And it's extremely unfortunate. And the decision, you know, doesn't sit well with me and lots of people in the Lone Star State. And, and when you talk about those acceptable forms of ID, let's quickly go through them. In Texas now, as of now, you can vote with a driver's license, an election identification certificate, I'm not sure what that is, a Texas ID card, concealed handgun license is good, a U.S. passport, which very few Americans have, a U.S. military ID, or a U.S. citizenship certificate. Not acceptable. A college student ID card, or a voter registration card. Cheryl and Eiffel, explain to me how it is possible that a voter registration card is not valid ID. And was that the reason um, that, the, that the, the dissent was so scathing? Because that does seem a little bit odd. Well, well, uh, Joy, this is our second go-round on this restrictive voter ID law that Texas has imposed again. We filed suit and challenged this suit under Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act in 2012, and we won. A, a federal court then found it was the most restrictive voter ID law in the country. It was only the Supreme Court's decision in the Shelby County voting rights case in 2013, which essentially removed the power of Section 5, that allowed Texas to reimpose the same law that had already been been found uh, to violate uh, the Voting Rights Act. And so we had to now file suit again. And what's really remarkable about this case, Joy, that I think the listeners need to understand is that when Justice Ginsburg surmises that hundreds of thousands of voters will be disenfranchised by a law that is discriminatory, she is not guessing. A federal judge two weeks ago found that this law, this voter ID law, discriminates against African Americans and Latino voters. And moreover, she found that the law intentionally discriminates against African American and Latino voters. That means today, when early voting begins in Texas, there are hundreds of thousands of voters who are barred from voting, including our clients, students who have a university ID that they were able to use in 2012 to vote, that are no longer allowed to use that university ID, no longer allowed to use the voter registration card that they received uh, pursuant to the prior law. So this is a critical moment, a powerful moment, not just for Texas, but in American democracy, when we know and have a finding by a federal judge that hundreds of thousands of people would be, will be disenfranchised, that the law discriminates and was designed to discriminate, and yet that law goes forward today. And I want to come back and talk to you a little bit, Sharon, about that notion uh, that the Supreme Court seems to be wanting to see how these laws play out rather than, 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 than taking into account a trial court's finding about the intent. But, but before I do that, uh, Representative Martinez Fisher, let's talk about that for a second. You're in the legislature. Was it your sense when this law was being debated that it was being intentionally put forward to reduce turnout among what is now essentially a Minority that is a majority in Texas. Well, one key fact that was found by Judge Ramos in Corpus Christi was the fact that 
the state was running reports to look at those impacted. The state of Texas, the legislative leadership, they knew that people would be thrown under the bus and not have the resources that they needed to vote, and the law went forward anyway. There was no attempt to negotiate. There was no attempt to expand the franchise. There, th this is a voter ID legislation that's been proposed several times. Every session had been killed. In 2011, all the stops were pulled out. All the procedural rules were removed. This bill was placed in one single committee so they could be passed timely. Uh, let me just put it to you another way. There was not a single minority that had an opportunity to represent minority Texans and made sure that their viewpoints were heard before this law was passed. And the result, you see it in Judge Ramos's opinion, 147 pages that says this amounts to intentional discrimination and a poll tax, and it is not good legislation. And Cheryl, Ramos, I think that is what is really chilling to a lot of people, is that you did have this extensive trial that your organization, uh, you know, participated in litigating that does seem to have been summarily dismissed by the Supreme, by the Appeals Court and the Supreme Court, just set aside. And when you look at the record of the court, having cut early voting, allowed uh, early voting to be cut in Ohio, ending same day registration in North Carolina, saying that's fine. Allowing a new voter ID law in Wisconsin, which they actually did do some action to delay it being for this particular election, and now allowing this. It, it, are people rightly worried that the current construction of the Supreme Court is not on the side of voters? Well, the, I think the most charitable uh, explanation you can have for the Supreme Court's action, Joy, is essentially what they have said in all of these cases is, we're not going to allow a change to happen so close to the election, right? That's what, what is consistent across all of these opinions. And so I think it's important to remember that the Supreme Court's decision uh, this weekend actually does not speak to the facts that Justice, that Judge Ramos found in her decision after our trial. Uh, and as I said, it could be the court essentially saying, we keep the status quo uh, when it's this close to an election. The problem is that the Texas case differs from all the other cases that you described in that it has this voluminous record, in that it has this finding of intentional discrimination. And I think that's the part that's disturbing. Is the Supreme Court saying that even if there is a law that is found to intentionally discriminate, we allow that law to go forward because it will cause confusion and will upset Texas in terms of uh, its election procedures. I think that's why this case really strikes a chord, because it is materially different than those other cases because of that finding of intentional discrimination. Yeah, and, and we're, we're really out of short on time, but I just want to very quickly ask the representative, is there a plan in place among uh, members of your uh, legislature to try to help people acquire the acceptable forms of the ID? Well, you know, given that one third of Texas counties don't have a facility to get this ID, it's going to be pretty hard. But make no mistake, together with our allies, we're not going to give up. Justice doesn't come easy when it comes to civil rights and voting rights. And we will, will remain steadfast in our litigation efforts. But at the same time, we will make sure that all voices are heard, both in the courtroom and in the voting booth. All right. Uh, Sherilyn Eiffel and Trey Martinez Fisher, thank you both for being here. Thank you, Joy. All right. After thank the break, you. I'll.